Hey everybody, uh, welcome back. And um, this is what we're talking about today, expressionism. Um, this is the second lecture of the week and um, I know I'm not in my like pristine white walled environment anymore. Uh, I'm actually in an artist studio right now. Um, and uh, so this to give you a little bit of a, an understanding of where we are in our course um, with my illness and, and how that's affected things. Um, the thing with online courses that's great is that you can rewatch any of these lectures um, whenever you want and because of the format, because I put them online, uh, you have the ability to access them whenever it's convenient for you. That means uh, that it's going to be very, it's going to be we're never going to cancel class. That's what I'm trying to say here. Um, so I was sick. Uh, that means that I got put back uh, behind schedule, but I know that I can get us caught up uh, and get us where we need to be by the time of our second quiz. So the second quiz is going to be on um, this week's lecture and next week's lecture and um, or lectures and you will have the ability to go through all of these lectures before you take that quiz. And again, as some of you have taken this first test, um, uh, uh, granted there were some hiccups and I'm working those out, um, but that happens, it's the first one, Blackboard changes all the time, and so um, it's often very difficult for us to get a handle on where we are with that, like as far as technical stuff. So um, that stuff's going to happen um, it, and that's why I assign these little things incrementally before the big assignments like a midterm or a final exam or the research paper. Um, instead, uh, we can have these little bumps in the road on like a four point quiz or a four point essay or whatever, whatever. So, um, so that said, uh, I'm going to just get us up to speed, get us up to where we need to be. And that includes uh, a lecture today on expressionism. Now, you might understand that it, expressionism is kind of a vague term. Anything that is an expression is therefore considered expressionism. But expressionism, as we're going to talk about it today, deals with a specific kind of art practice. Um, one where artists began to f make the decisions that they wanted to totally freely. They were inspired by the impressionists, but Unlike the four art or the four little mini episodes that uh, happened in the last lecture, uh, these people aren't necessarily drawing direct links with the work of the impressionists. They're far enough out of the impressionist um, historical moment of 1871. Uh, we're at the turn of the century now, and um, we are going to backtrack a little bit when I introduce Paul Cezanne and Pablo Picasso next week, but. Um, for the sake of, of just generally getting through information, uh, we're going to talk about a few groups of artists, one group in France, one group in Germany, um, or, uh, and uh, two groups in Germany, excuse me, um, and, and how those, those artists used personal expression as a mode of conveying their, their sense of the world. So. If you do want to see a corollary between, say, the Impressionists and that initial break with the Academy, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, the, the structures of the art world, as it were, um, you can see this as, you know, an Impressionist went outside and recorded his experience in light. And what these artists are doing is they're, they, they're forsaking all aspects of trying to actually mime the landscape in front of them. And instead, what they're doing is um, uh, they're presenting their psychological place. They are talking to you about how they feel in these moments and how they are using the things of their studio, the paints, the different colors, the different brushes, the different um, techniques to convey a sense of psychological reality and a psychological place uh, where the Impressionists were dealing very heavily with um, of the physical space, the physical place of being in, in plein air outside and looking at uh, the landscape in front of them. Um, and so to get things rolling, um, this 
work is not going to be on any exam. It's not going to be on any quiz. Uh, I'm not ever going to ask you any questions about it. It's too culturally loaded for us. It's too difficult for us to... Um, all of you probably have seen some iteration of this, whether it be on a sweatshirt or in a Simpsons spoof or um, the, the Wes Craven movie that uh, was titled uh, similarly and had a bad guy with a mask the shape of this screaming character's face, uh, the scream, guys. This is Edward Munch's The Scream. Um, and this is a work that was dealt with by, um, by our author. And uh, it's pretty much indicative of everything that I'm trying to convey with this sense of psychological place. The story goes, and it's fairly simple, that Edwin Munch was walking with some friends uh, through downtown Oslo, uh, and he kind of looked around and realized that something was wrong. He could he he was just this very very bad feeling set in, and it like it made him very sad, generally speaking. Um, but it also was horrifying to him. He said that he could feel his environment screaming, and he stopped, and uh, what this character, this central figure here in the, um, right here, is, uh, is showing is, is most psychological awareness of that place. Um, he didn't give much description on what he saw. Maybe it was some smoke sacks in the distance and he was afraid for Mother Nature and industrialization. Maybe he saw um, a bourgeoisie family or a middle-class family walking um, with their child and he was uh, concerned that that child would never, say, grow up on a farm or, uh, or, or experience a farm, let alone grow up on a farm. And, and that might have caused him some emo uh, emotional distress. We don't know what emotional distress was caused, all we know is the result of it. And it was this tumultuous um, s fear. Uh, and, and that's why this work is titled The Scream, because internally, Monk, his psychology, his being, was screaming out um, against what was going on uh, and what he was seeing. And this work of art is indicative of that uh, very clearly. Now. The next groups of artists that we're going to be talking about break just slightly with that. You know, the French guys are really happy, but they're they're kind of still involved with some impressionism. Um, but the German folks that we're going to be looking at are um, it, it's a pretty big shift from from that moment. So, um, what I can do now is upload really long videos onto YouTube and record really long videos. So I'm just going to roll with this and hope to wrap this whole conversation up in less than an hour. Um, there aren't that many slides and I think that we can do it. So we're going to hit the ground rolling. Vlamenc Matisse Durand. Uh, these are the three gentlemen who historically get most of the cred for being what we refer to as le fauve. That translates directly to the wild beasts. An exhibition review of this show as uh, captured by Mr. Gompertz in our text is uh, that the reviewer came in, he saw this work, uh, talked about this work, and then referred to these three men as wild beasts as in they were not to be tamed by the structures of the academy and they were not even to be tamed by the structures of society in general. Instead, they were making works of art that were about their physical experience but also about their psychological experience and instead of being at all concerned with um, the way that palette reflected reality, they were interested in the way that palette, ref palette reflected psychology. Now when I say palette here, I mean the colors that they're using on their canvases. Yes, the flat thing that artists often hold or um, with dots of color on it are referred to as a palette. That word also implies this, the, that color scheme and how it operates on the actual canvas. 
Um, so for the portrait of um, of Lamenc here, um, uh, and this is a portrait by Andre Durand. Um, uh, or by yeah, yeah, by by Durand. This is a portrait of Henri Matisse by Durand, and this is a portrait of uh, Andre Durand by Henri Matisse. Um, so, uh, Vlamenc, the, you know, if you look at this, you know what, I'm going to skip ahead and we're going to talk about this work because this work makes a lot more sense. You know what a landscape looks like. You know what a street looks like. Uh, you know that very, very, very few buildings are painted pink. This work by Maurice Vlamenc is, uh, one of the works that was initially shown in the show that was referred to at with where they got the name Le Fauve. Um and this work shows the kind of wildness that these artists were inhabiting or displaying um, there's there is a sense of order to the colors that they choose uh, you know it isn't totally uh, arbitrary you know the the pink that exists on the building this pink right here is not really seen in any other places on the canvas. So for Vlamenc, that color was the color of brick. The road here, as indicated in yellow, it goes up here, um, is pretty much the only location of that yellow on this canvas, meaning that at this moment for Vlamenc, that was the color of the street. Chances are he was seeing the way that light was reflected on the street, uh, but instead of choosing, say, a lighter tone of gray or a lighter tone of amber, he chose this very, well, I guess ochre is a lighter tone of amber, um, this, this color of, of, of ochre or uh, kind of must, mustardy yellow. This is probably all um, reminiscent of, at least I hope it's reminiscent of Paul Serussier. Uh, who was one of the Nabi painters, and he was the one of the first people to really use a wild palette in the presentation of his works. Um, these guys were very much inspired by him, and for whatever reason, history doesn't ever want to draw that connection. They want you to see the the foe as being this breakout group. This group that totally revolutionized color, that totally changed the way that people experience emotional reality and psychological reality within these canvases. But the fact of the matter is, as I, as I is hope as I hope is clear, the fact is the fact of the matter, which I hope is clear. That's saying that right. Uh, is that nothing comes out of nothing. Uh, Artistic traditions, artistic breakthroughs are passed down slowly. And uh, these guys definitely saw Sorusier's Le Talisman, right? They had to have. Um, it was shown in Paris. They were of the same group. They were interested in the same conversations. They knew the same people. There is, it's so unlikely that they did not see the work or um, they did not hear about the work because okay maybe they weren't in Paris when it was on view but they ch chances are they heard of it and they knew what the deal was because it was the talisman it was the thing that that changed the way that people viewed uh, color and viewed palette and viewed the way that color interacted with their landscape this is a portrait of Henri Matisse's wife now, Gompertz says that she would have been very dismayed at the presentation of her body, her skin tone, um, her the structure of her face. I mean, there's not that much detail. I imagine that um, a great majority of you, if given uh, you know, 10 minutes, a friend, and a pencil, you'd be able to make an image of your friend that looks something similar to this. Uh, I say that because... Uh, Matisse is deliberately de-skilling himself 
he is a masterful painter. He can make works that rival a lot of really, really fantastic artists. But he's not choosing to do that. Instead, he's choosing to be rough around the edges. He's choosing to go for a more universal facial structure so that more people can see themselves in the position of this woman than, um, th than say, a portrait of a proper lady that is commissioned by uh, her, her husband uh, that looks only like her, that is supposed to only ever be read as her. Matisse, on the other hand, is very interested in having this universal. Now, I start off by saying uh, I started off by saying that you know Gompert says that uh, Lady Matisse would have been upset. I really doubt that, to be quite honest. Uh, I mean, when you are at such close proximity with someone making something, the way that she was in very close proximity to Henri while he was making these early Fauve paintings. You, you, you're part of that conversation. There's almost no way, given where Matisse was in his life, he wasn't an aristocrat, they lived in a small house, um, they had a decent amount of money, they had some kids, but they were still very much involved in each other's lives. So she would have known what he was doing in the studio. She wouldn't have been surprised to see this free form of color in the background, this kind of patchy, I mean, this almost looks very sketchy not in the like shady sense like don't go down that sketchy alley it looks like it's a sketch right she also would not have been surprised by the ornamentation of this hat you know she's seen her husband make sketches she has witnessed him in the studio none of this would have been surprising to her because as the adage goes Behind every great man is a great woman. And so standing directly behind Henri Matisse was Lady Matisse. She knew what was up. So um, just just throwing that out there as a little bit of a fact. And that was a good way for me to talk about things like the sketchiness of the background or the universal facial structure um, and the ornamental nature of the top hat that she is wearing and also um, the manner in which this almost becomes a level of ornament. The, her, the back of her shoulder here, and uh, the back of her shoulder here, and then this chair here. Uh, so, Henri Matisse, woman with hat. 1905 was the breakout year for the foes. 1905-1906 um, are when their works were uh, really causing a, a stir, and you know, a, an important thing to understand with this is 1905-1906, there was a stir, there was this article that pronounced these men as wild beasts, but instead of that being met with hundreds of people going to exhibitions and ridiculing their work, ooh, excuse me, um, instead of lots and lots and lots of people caricatur caricaturing these paintings or making fun of these paintings in the newspaper. Uh, what you have actually is collectors that see this, this rebelliousness and actually really want to be a part of it. They want to buy these works. So you had this initial revolution in aesthetics over here in the 1860s and then by the time we get over here to the 1905 time period, um, there's a consumer. There's a person who actually wants to own these things, and they want to buy these things, and they want to be uh, the, the collector of this new kind of painting. But an important thing to note is they're not buying it because they think it's going to be worth a lot of money the way that a lot of people... Um, are now attracted into the art world, they were buying it because of this cachet of being in the know. If you knew who the Fauves were in 1906 and you had the means to procure one, you were in a, a very, very small group of international thinkers that um, 
were, were cool that people actually looked to and wanted to be a part of and you know the salon around Gertrude Stein which we're going to be talking about next week when we deal with Pablo Picasso was this such group you have Americans that expatriate they leave the United States to live in Paris before and between the wars um, and they fostered this kind of aesthetic conversation that became not only about art, but it also became about being basically cool. I mean, I, I, equating all of this stuff to coolness makes me feel like I'm dumbing it down for you, um, but to a certain extent, that is the way it works. These people, they were buying these works because they were interested in being privy to this conversation. Now here we have another painting by Henri Matisse, uh, Le Bonheur de Vivre, or The Joy of Life. Um, this work, it has a lot of conversations with the work of Paul Gauguin. Paul Gauguin was searching for this kind of reality. This moment where you have nubile, naked bodies littering the landscape and everyone is kind of passively enjoying themselves with song, with dance, with relaxation, and maybe a little cuddling. Gauguin searched the world for it and ended up in Tahiti. Matisse knew that this was going to be a very difficult thing to hunt down, and so instead he searched for it psychologically. And for him, the joy of life wasn't about finding an actual place on the planet Earth where this kind of stuff happens. It was about dreaming of it. it and, and for that, in that, it was about a break with consciousness. It wasn't about him thinking about how Parisian he was, how French he was, how revolutionary he was. He knew all of those things. Instead, it was about actually thinking about the kind of life that he wanted to have. Andre Durand here. Uh, this is London Bridge from 1906. This is one of his most famous works. Um, and uh, the one thing I really like about this is it brings us just ever so slightly out of the borders of the French country and into another arena. So uh, London Bridge, obviously we're in the United Kingdom. And the same rules apply. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Think back to this. It's a very ordered landscape, but the palette is different. <coughs> Again, a very ordered landscape, but the palette's different. Um, this could be about showing the, the color that was occurring because of light, the light source in the, the landscape. So maybe the light shining on the tidal river Thames made the slightly brackish water appear to be green. Maybe. Um, however, I doubt that something was going on that was, um, was making the sky that color red. This is free association of color. These guys were very interested in how color could convey emotional reality, and so um, that's really what they wanted to do. That's it. Um, psychologically, you can see that there is something exuberant. Um, and that exuberance is indicative of an understanding or maybe um, a pacifying of angst against industrialization. The Impressionists, you know, think back to Monet's Gare Saint-Lazare, the interior of the train station that I showed you in the, our first lecture. That was about a man who was so used to painting outside that he went uh, into this space that was actually very outside. I mean, all of you have been in train stations and um, uh, the larger ones in the city feel almost exactly like the smaller ones that are farther out into the country. Um, they're fairly open. Uh, it's not like they want trains to come in and out of closing doors. So the doors are always open, platforms. So Matisse was or not Matisse, yeah, uh, Monet, excuse me. Monet was effectively outside when he painted Gar Saint Lazare. And he was mesmerized and kind of put off by how, it, more mesmerized than anything, by the scale of industrialization. Fast forward 
10 years and you get to Georges Pierre Seurat, who is kind of disturbed by the amount of buildup in the city. And at his bathers, Asnier, where you have these passive people lying on a beach and in the background you have the smokestack, you know, he's seeing the frenzied nature of the city and he's countering that by having this very passive, almost slow motion reality. The next generation, this generation, has seemed to digest those principles fully. And instead of being wary of industrialization, they begin to see this new buildup of city, the frenzy of urban life, uh, the culture of urban life as being an incredibly positive thing. And so um, works like The Joy of Life, yes, they put these nubile naked bodies passively into a landscape, but the, this work was designed specifically for urban eyes. Urban eyes that liked the, their urban life, but wanted to fantasize about this Arcadian landscape. Now, Arcadia is this fictive place where, basically, people lie around naked and play music and dance and occasionally cuddle. Um, uh, it's a motif that I'm going to bring up next week when we talk about Paul Cezanne, um, and it's something that Paul Gauguin was looking for. It's something that urbaners know, and they are okay with imagining it and dreaming it. But this, however, is an urban landscape. It's a place in a very real part of the world, but it also has this sense of exuberance and excitement and joy. And that's the thing about La Fauve, is it is very much about this, this excitement for life. Um, and the chaos of the color palette uh, is very ordered. It's not wild, so to speak. I mean, it's, it's wild in the way that a lion in a circus is wild. Uh, yes, ultimately it is a beast, but uh, that beast has been um, brought under the under the the handling of of human society. And in these works, you see that um, human society is getting a little bit of a handle on urbanization, and that's a really important thing. And it's good, like I said, when we go back in time a little bit to talk about Paul Cezanne, we're gonna go well back in time. Before we go back in time, however, we're going to go to Germany. Um, De Brucke. This is the first stop in uh, in these kinds of courses when you go abroad. This is an art group that doesn't get much uh, ink in our textbook because they didn't have that much of. Uh, I don't know why. I'm not going to make excuses. I don't know why he didn't put them in the book. Um, it seems crazy to me because these guys are really, really influential especially today. Um, I'm starting off with uh, painting the portrait of Marianne uh, von Ver Verfkin. Um, is how, uh, how you pronounce her last name, Verfkin. Uh, it's by a female painter named Gabrielle Munter. Gabrielle Munter was an, a painter based in Munich. And um, she, because historians in recent years have tried to um, basically give more credibility to the female artists that were involved in a lot of these different groups. Um, something that Willie Gompertz doesn't really do at all. He doesn't mention any female artists until probably the 1960s, which is insane and um, kind of horrible. Gotta say, I know there's some women out in the audience, and uh, I will say that ladies, uh, there were ladies making paintings forever. Um, they weren't structurally allowed to really show those paintings, um, but every once in a while they did. And I showed you Bert Morisot's The Cradle. I showed you Mary Cassatt's uh, Woman with Pearl Necklace in the Loge, and you also watched the Mary Cassatt video. Um, in Germany, however, the art history is a little funny. Gabriel Munter has been uh, attributed to being member members of two group, a member of two groups in Germany. One is De Brucke, which translates to The Bridge. The other is Der Blue Reiter, and we're going to get to them in just a moment. The reality is that she was involved more fully with the latter group, Der Blue Reiter, Der, Der Blue Reiter, that's how you pronounce it, um, which translates to the Blue Rider. Um, but she's a great painter, and a lot of the way that she uh, 
makes work is indicative of this German style, which has an incredible, incredible proximity to the Fauves. Here you have a very pictorially ordered portrait of a young woman, Marianne. But the palette's different. It's charged. It's charged with energy. It's charged with exuberance. It's it like vibrates. Those those colors are so um, the way that she's layered the colors, the way that she's blended them. Uh, it really the to see this in person, it pops out at you. It kind of jumps jumps off the canvas. And um, this is something that was being done by both De Bruca or the Bridge and also De Blue Writer, the Blue Writer group. So these two groups. One primarily based in Dresden, De Bruyne or De Bruca, excuse me. The other primarily based in Munich, De Bruyne. So, Dresden, Munich. <coughs> Got it. Um, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, bathers at Moritzburg. This is a work from 1910. And um, the way the, the way De Bruca works, uh, it was a group of artists that were living outside of uh, the urban centers in Germany. They were not living in Dresden when they first were became a group, which was somewhere around 1907 and 1908. They knew they wanted to be a group of painters. They knew they wanted to come together and have a group identity because they saw the success of a group that had done that in Paris. The Impressionists, they came together because they had similar painting styles and a name was applied to them. But by the time news of the Impressionists spread to Germany, the German newspapers were saying there's this group of artists that are referred to as the Impressionists that are making waves. And so this group of German artists primarily led by Kirchner, uh, decided that they wanted to copy that style in hopes at having a similar uh, fate, uh, in hopes of getting famous, you know. Um, I think it actually has a lot of similarities to the way that, um, like, there are, like, hip-hop, not groups, but there are, like, posses, as it were, of MCs that come together, like, um, you know, Young Money is one of them. Uh, uh, the, the Aesop family is another one of them. And all these are kind of indicative of uh, Wu-Tang, uh, which, you know, going way back to the 1990s, uh, was a group that was wildly successful, but it was comprised of a variety of different MCs. All of them had their own agendas, but they would come together for these for the recording of these projects because they knew collectively they would have more power and authority than being individual artists uh, because of the way the music industry uh, worked then. Because of the way the art industry was working in, in Europe at this time, these painters decided that they would have more of a chance of success if they came together and pronounced themselves collectively and showed their work collectively even though they were not all say, uh, you wouldn't walk, you knew who made which work is the, the gist of this. So these guys were similarly very interested in the idea of our, the Arcadian landscape. The idea of these bodies being outside, this proximity between man, his, his body, and I mean man in the set in like the universal sense, which I know is not very feminist, but sorry. Um, you know, man and his terrestrial body uh, being in nature and communing with nature and all that stuff. And, uh, and so in paintings like this, what Kirchner was doing was reminiscing about the, a time when he and his friends would go down to their swimming hole and it would be uh, a mix of genders, a mix of people, and it didn't matter. It was actually about just swimming, enjoying life with your friends, and having a good time. Now think about this in conjunction with uh, Matisse's Bona de la Vive. This is a made-up landscape of bodies in nature. This, according to the way Kirchner tells it, is 
a reminiscence of fake, real. Um, one thing that is, uh, uh, I think, makes that distinction a little more obvious in that that is inherent in the work is the manner in which these bodies are painted. Now they're painted very quickly, right? Look at this person's body. Um, it's just a, a mark of a few lines. Uh, it's just a few scrapes of a brush across the canvas and voila, you have the image of a person. Um, if you look at you know, this figure here, um, there's not a lot of detail in that face. There's not a lot of detail in, uh, in the, the other gestures of the body. It really is just a few disparate uh, um, brush marks that come together to give you a sense of what this person is, or uh, the, the shape of this person's body. Um, now, I know disconcertingly, this figure is going to draw some attention. She is dead center. She is crouching down. She looks as though she is doing who knows what. Um, when we talk about uh, Pablo Picasso, I'm going to be bringing up an idea called primitivism. Um, it makes a lot more sense, and it's an easier story to tell when I deal specifically with Pablo Picasso's work. Um, but I will be referencing this work, and specifically this female figure, when I talk about Picasso because um, this is primitivism. So I'm kind of giving you a little bit of a teaser. So think about primitivism, write it down in your notes, and next week when you watch your lecture on Pablo Picasso, the word, the idea, and the reason why this young uh, woman is in this position and taking such a central focus in this painting is going to become very clear. Um, that's Kirchner. We're going to see another Kirchner in just a sec. Like one sec. Right here. Uh, this was a reminiscence. This is 1910. This is 1908. Um, and I'm looking at my notes. I had, I had things a little bit mix, mixed up with the dates. Uh, between 1906 and 1907, uh, the, a group of painters in the the rural districts surrounding Dresden came together and began to refer to themselves as De Brucke or The Bridge. By 1908, when this work was finished, those artists had moved from the rural center or from their rural landscape into the urban center of Dresden. They were not really into being city people. They didn't like it. That's why works like this came out after they moved because they started thinking about how much better it was when they were young and could be naked and swimming with their friends and I mean buying the naked thing I would rather be swimming with my friends all the time I mean even if we're uh, yeah I mean it naked or not naked it doesn't matter I'd much rather be swimming as I'm sure all of you would be I mean who doesn't want to be at the river right now although it's 14 degrees outside um, but for this scene where this is a little bit more natural, the colors on the bodies are, are at least referential to the actual bodies of most German people at that time. I mean, you have this kind of uh, yellowy, peachy skin. They're Caucasian people. Um, the, the, the facial structures, the hair colors, they're all relative to what human beings actually look like. When you look at this street scene in Dresden, <coughs> you get something that is very much not lifelike. You have toxic green faces right here. Toxic orange faces right here, excuse me. Um, but the thing that I think really shows you just exactly how Kirchner feels about being in Dresden is again right in the center of the work. I put my thing over. these programs everybody these programs this little girl right here um, this is a young girl who is walking down a city street 
she has a bonnet on and she is carrying a candy cane or a, a lollipop it's cute if Norman Rockwell had made this work she would be adorable she'd have rosy cheeks and she'd probably be being carried by like a, a, a soldier or the milkman or something like that uh, we'll talk about Norman Rockwell later uh, that's not what Kirkner saw what Kirkner saw was a brat a spoiled child someone who is not listening to their parents not minding their parents you can see that she's in a city street and she's effectively by herself she is a terror um, and she chances are she's making quite a bit of noise look at the way that Kirkner has drawn her hood her bonnet it looks like that it looks like she is her, like it's almost like a Tim Burton character out of The Nightmare Before Christmas where like the head pops back and it's just, the, or Beetlejuice. It's like screaming. I hope you guys have seen Beetlejuice or Nightmare Before Christmas. I might be dating myself, which is crazy because those are classics. You should watch them. They're beautiful. Anyway, this like screaming child, like, ah! um, So that's what Kirkner sees in the city. You know, he sees in the countryside these kids that are abiding by their parents. They're nearby their parents. They, you know, they're sure they get in trouble and they wander off, but they don't do it in the, in the urban environs of Dresden. This was a place that was chaotic and frenzied and kind of unsafe for a lot of people. And here's this child just like in the middle of the canvas, like, ah! like really a vile image of a child. Um, and, you know, if that child was in a situation where this woman's face was not yellow or orange excuse me and this woman's face was not this kind of putrid green i would say i might read this entire painting differently but the fact of the matter is by having these two people and even you know this person here this person here all these people look like they're they're sick um that's something that kirkner did quite often it was it it was this kind of disgust with uh, with the urban center, nasty. Another of the De Brucke group that moved from uh, the country into Dresden is Max Peckstein. Here we have Indian and woman. Um, now this work uh, is indicative of a change that happens with regard to these painters. Painters stopped being people that were just copying landscapes or copying the shapes of human forms. Instead, they became cool. You know, like I was saying, uh, people in France wanted to buy Fauve paintings because they were cool painters. Well, by the time that culture was being spread around, artists were getting a little bit of a cred behind them. It was cool the way it, it you know, it was, it's cool to be in a band these days back then it's real cool to be an artist man um what peckstein is giving us here is an inside view of his artist studio now this is something that a lot of artists have done historically for probably the last 150 years uh beginning in and around the time of the magna carta like mid mid 17th century um Inside the artist's studio, generally, what uh, when you saw these paintings in uh, the historical tradition, it would be about how masterfully the artist could render certain things. And so there would be, you know, a pot of flowers sitting on the desk to show that the artist had the ability to paint still lives very beautifully. There would often be a person sitting in the room looking through different portfolios to show that he could also paint the human form very accurately. By this time period, after the turn of the century, uh, specifically in Germany, artists were tipping into becoming intellectuals. An artist was a person who could give his, his or her viewer the perspective into other modes of thinking. And in this case, we have um, this character that he refers to as the Indian, uh, and that means somebody from the Indian subcontinent, not a native person or an indigenous person. Um, at this point, a lot of Eastern faith was coming over and infiltrating 
the European landscape. Basically, things like Buddhism were coming back, and people were having what was referred to as a spiritual awakening. And what Pechstein is doing by including this person from the place where these kinds of enlightened ideas are coming from, he is saying that uh, to his viewers, inside of my artist studio, you will find different ways of thinking about consciousness. You will find different levels of enlightenment. You will find that I am Un I understand these different faiths. I understand Buddhism. I understand the lotus flower inside of all of us. Um, and I have an understanding of it that I will pass on to you. Now, not only is this indicated by the fact that this person, this character, this Indian, is from the Indian subcontinent in Asia, it's also indicated by the fact that he's seated next to a mirror. A mirror in art, in art history generally indicates a window into another place, another reality, specifically another reality where you know yourself that much more. When we look at ourselves in the mirror, we know like where we have to shave, we know how we have to do our hair, we know what we have to do or how we, have to, how we look. In this instance, that mirror is shining back to Pechstein a kind of interior understanding of themselves. They get who they are inside and out. The inclusion of the woman in the lower part of the frame is, uh, well, if you look at you know, her facial structures, she is, and when we talk about primitivism, this is going to become a bigger uh, consideration, she is a non-Western woman. Pechstein, in addition to saying that he has access to non-Western modes of faith, as in the, the, his Indian shaman in the top part of the painting, he has access to non-Western body types, which is another big cachet here. This painting is Pechstein saying, I know these things and I'm cool because of it and you should like me because I know all of these things because I'm cool. Um, I Yes, I am slightly equating this to like hipster modality, but that's life. Uh, Carl Schmidt Rutloff is doing the same thing. This is a self-portrait of a painter. But instead of him holding a paintbrush and a palette the way that uh, Bonard is, did in his self-portrait from uh, 12 years earlier, Rutleaf is painting himself as an intellectual. He's smoking a cigarette, he has a monocle, he's got a turtleneck, he has this weird shape behind him of drawn curtains that actually seems to almost be a crown. You know, this yellow shape. Uh, um, so he is saying that he is a painter in that he made this image of a man in a room and, uh, and that man being himself, but he is an intellectual first. He's not going to hold a paintbrush. He's not going to hold a palette. For him, it's much more about conveying the sense that he has an intellectual awareness and that he can convey that to um, the people that he interacts with, uh, his audience, his collectors, his other ar artistic milieu, that kind of stuff. Now, really quickly, um, we're going to talk about Der Blureiter, which was the group that developed in Munich. So we were in Dresden beforehand, now we're in Munich. Both of those two cities had major art schools in them, and so both of these groups were seen, like the Impressionists, as breaking down the academy structure. Here is a, a, a print made by one of the artists associated with Der Blue Reiter. It was the cover of a journal that they published. Um, the uh, German Expressionists that I showed you before, De Brucke, were also printmakers. Um, avid, avid, avid printmakers. Uh, and when we talk about art between the wars, and we talk about the in basically art around the First World War, I'm going to be showing you some German Expressionist um, woodblock prints as well. So, so this is uh, the Blue Rider. Obviously, it translates uh, into a Blue Rider. Uh, those are pretty direct cognates, as in they translate very easily. Um, and the image on the cover of this book is a blue person on a blue horse, i.e. a blue rider. 
Um, these guys were very, very, very interested in color theory. But the color theory that they espoused was different than, is different than, our color theory. So you're going to be seeing things like this where unnatural tones are applied to natural figures. That is to indicate a certain kind of emotional reality. Here we have Franz Marx's hap The Yellow Cow. Now doesn't this cow just look really happy? It's out of the landscape, it's playing, it's bucking around, it's having a good time. It's yellow. It's yellow. It's yellow. Um, yellow in, the, in this color theory is the color of happiness. It's the color of joy. Um, and so when Mark, uh, who was an avid naturalist, he very much liked to be outside. He had a lot of respect for uh, animals and the, the natural world as a lot of these artists did uh, back because they had more access to the natural world. Um, so he wanted to paint natural forms and so he painted this yellow cow and he painted it in yellow with blue spots to indicate that it was a happy cow. This is pretty much a masterpiece of De Brucke. They wanted to convey this sense of emotional um, of the emotionality of, of color tones, uh, but they did it by representing the known landscape. So it was slightly abstract. Obviously, no landscape in Germany looks like that um, with the kind of undulating natural forms that recess back towards those really bizarre looking mountains. Um, but then again, obviously, no cow is yellow. So he's, he's taking artistic liberties and enjoying the making of this painting. Now, again, when we get to the art around the First World War, um, this, his work is going to change. And um, when we deal with the Italian group, the Futurists, I'm going to bring these guys back up, specifically Mark, uh, and show you that um, he, he gets to be really angsty towards modernization and really doesn't have that big of an affinity for it. Vasily Kandinsky, um, composition number four. Uh, Kandinsky is a hugely influential artist. Um, he basically invented pictorial abstraction. Uh, there's a few different people that pretend or purport to have done it. Uh, Kandinsky got the most acclaim for doing it early, and so he kind of takes the crown. Um, saying that somebody is first or second or 15th, in this kind of aesthetic development I think is kind of arbitrary. Um, the first person to do something is often not the first person, they're just the first person that someone else noticed and decided to write down. Um, other than something like, you know, there we do know that Lance Armstrong was the first person to walk on the moon, but we also know that um, Christopher Columbus was not the first person to sail across the ocean and land on North America. So it, that's what I mean when I say firsts. So, this work from 1911. Uh, we're getting fairly ahead of ourselves, but I just wanted to show you Kandinsky's work in relation to W. Reiter before his work comes back up when we talk about later abstract painting. And we will talk about other f art forms other than painting, but painting is the most important art form in the West, and this is a Western art history course. So, we're stuck with painting for a little while. This is like Franz Marc, the yellow cow. This is a painting of a place. This is a landscape and I hope that some of you have made that out. Um, uh, more than that, I hope that you all have read the description of this painting in our text where Gompert says that these three dots are actually three Cossacks that are carrying um, these staffs that cut very directly across the canvas. Um, it's much harder to draw a straight line with your finger than you would imagine. Um, ooh, look at that. Um, bingo. It's all about discovery, everybody. Um, so, uh, you know, back here we have some land, some uh, land masses. Here we have 
either a shadow or I think it's probably a road that these gentlemen have walked down. Um, here is this really funny thing, it's inclusion of a rainbow. I don't know why there's a rainbow in this one. Um, Kandinsky was a theorist, he was a thinker, he was a writer, he was a very influential guy, um, and he, <clears throat> when we talk about modernism in America, I'm going to be bringing up uh, a piece of writing that he did called Concerning the Spiritual and Art, because um, making these artworks is one thing. You know, if you make an artwork, there's a very good likelihood. When you make an artwork that is this rebellious, and totally kind of blows apart any idea of what a uh, landscape should look like and becomes this very, very different thing. Um, you, uh, you run the risk of being, of somebody writing a review. But if somebody writes a review, then that means other people in other parts of the world are gonna read the review or read about you know this, this man, Kandinsky, making these paintings that are kind of not kind of relative to the landscape. But when you actually write text, when you publish a manifesto or a text, that can get published in a newspaper so much easier, so much quick, more quickly, and therefore your legacy or your ideas spread very, very fast. And so he wrote this, this thing concerning the spiritual and art. He published it. It then was spread throughout the world. And so um, Kandinsky is kind of a, a predicate for other things that we're going to be looking at later on in, uh, in the next few weeks. Um, and this is the end of this, of this day. Um, it was, especially when we got, we're dealing with the Germans, got these German painters, it was more of just like introducing you to these people. They will become very important later on. Um, and I just need to lay some, some of the groundwork as we move forward. So, with that said, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your weekend.